1948. For Palestinians, that year is a Nakba, or the catastrophe. When hundreds of thousands were forced out of their homes, For Israelis, that year marks the creation of the State of Israel. As a filmmaker and as a Palestinian, this documentary series was my way to understand the events of the past that are still shaping the present. This is Pathé Gazette, screening it. Theoretically, you're due for a share of these. They're real Jaffas being gathered in the groves of Palestine for shipment to Britain. Images from another time, when Palestinians still worked their land. Few Palestinians, if any, could imagine they were to become victims of what would later be known as ethnic cleansing. After 30 years of British rule, the question of Palestine was referred to the United Nations. The UN now became the forum for conflict. Talks focused on dividing Palestine into an Arab and Jewish state. For granting the Jewish Agency for Palestine a hearing, when we speak of a Jewish state, we do not have in mind any racial state or any theocratic state, but one which will be based upon full equality and rights for all inhabitants without distinction of religion or race and without domination or subjugation. November the 29th, 1947. The UN General Assembly met to devise a plan for the partition of Palestine. United Nations Resolution 181 divided Palestine into an Arab and a Jewish state, with Jerusalem being an internationalized city. The Jewish state would be granted 56% of the land. The city of Jaffa was included as an enclave of the Arab state. The land known today as the Gaza Strip was split from its surrounding agricultural regions, making the proposed state all but impractical in the eyes of many Palestinians. The draft resolution was presented for voting. The resolution of the Deaf Committee for Palestine was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against 10 abstentions. أمريكا بالأساس إذا وفي عهد ترومان هي التي صنعت هذا القرار ودفعت ثمنه عن طريق الضغط وعن طريق الرشاوي إلى عدد من مندوبي الدول وقد اعترف مندوبو لالبيريا في إفريقيا والفلبين وغواتيمالا عدد من الدول اعترفوا خطيا بمذكراتهم بالضغط الأمريكي عليهم أو على حكوماتهم للتصويت بدل التصويت مع العرب أو التصويت أو الامتناع عن التصويت إلى التصويت مع القرار الذي أمريكا وضعته. Arab newspapers ran a name and shame list of the countries that voted for the UN partition plan, and Arab protesters took to the streets. It was unthinkable in the United Nations or any other place in the world that a national liberation movement would uh, share the land with the settler community by dividing it. What was important for the Zionists in the United Nations Partition Resolution was that it 
provided Israel with international legitimacy, but they didn't care for the borders or uh, they didn't stop them from thinking how to dispossess the Palestinians. أرادوا ترسيخ المبدأ وهو مبدأ الدولة اليهودية حالما رسخ المبدأ وقبل دوليا هم هم تكفلوا بالتفاصيل ولذلك برأيي الترانسفير هو مترتب عن فكرة الدولة اليهودية في مكان لا يوجد فيه أغلبية يهودية وبالتالي لا لا مجال للف والدوران حول هذا الموضوع كلتي دولة يهودية كلتي ترانسفير following the partition resolution Britain announced it would end its mandate in Palestine on May the 14th, 1948. Outraged by the vote for partition, the Arab League decided to prepare the Palestinians for an armed resistance. Some 3,000 volunteers, some from across the Arab world, were sent for training in Syria. A figurehead for the struggle was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al Husseini. From his refuge in Lebanon, he felt confident the Palestinians, with help from the Arab countries, could prevail. Hajamin al Husseini, in 1937, he was from here, 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 he was from here. Palestinians began to organize local committees for self-defense. By the end of 1947, groups of young men were traveling to Damascus, Beirut and Cairo to acquire weapons and receive military training. Early 1948, Despite the presence of the British, the Jewish agency, led by David Ben-Gurion, asserted increasing military and administrative influence in Palestine. Jewish paramilitary forces included the Haganah, the Ergen, and the Sterngen. During the first half of 1948, their numbers swelled to as many as 40,000 men and women. On the other side, there were as few as 3,000 Palestinian irregulars. This was the remnants of the fighting force smashed by the British after the Arab Revolt in 1936. There were also an estimated 4,000 volunteers from the region, known as the Arab Liberation Army, led by an Arab nationalist called Fauzi al kawukashi In terms of fighters, the Palestinians were outnumbered and outgunned. A small group of Zionist leaders and military commanders met regularly on a weekly basis from February 1947 to February 1948 for a whole year, uh, planning the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. They didn't decide about it in a day. They had the weekly meetings, and in each week they became more and more convinced that this was the right way forward. In the first week of 1948, hostilities picked up there were two bomb attacks against Palestinian targets. The first, a car bomb, destroyed the old Ottoman government house in Jaffa. It killed 26 people. The second, the bombing of the Samiramis Hotel in Jerusalem, killed over 20. At Oxford University's Middle East Center, we found an important document. It contained details of a meeting on January the 6th, 1948, between the British High Commissioner for Palestine and David Ben-Gurion. The High Commissioner inquired about reports that Haganah was responsible for the attack on the Samira Miss Hotel. Ben-Gurion conceded this might be the case. And in a letter he sent two days later, Ben-Gurion confirmed Haganah's responsibility for the attack. 
During the first three months of 1948, Jewish paramilitary groups carried out dozens of attacks on Palestinian cities and villages. Some operations were carried out by special units of Jews disguised as Arabs, known as Mistaravim. A direct challenge to the United Nations and its powers of war prevention comes from Palestine. The definition of legal and illegal forces becomes daily more obscure. Haganah, the force first legally raised for the defense of Jewish settlements, appears to function hand in glove with Irgun Sfaileumi the outlawed terrorist army. The well-trained Jewish forces began to put their plans into action. On February the 15th, 1948, fighters from the Haganah and Palmach organizations attacked the village of Kaysaria near Haifa. A young man called Yitzhak Rabin is believed to have been one of the field commanders in the assault. Over 1,000 Palestinians were expelled from Kesaria as the village was torched to the ground. Uh, what the uh, Zani's forces did, they uh, uh, targeted five villages on the coast and, and experimented with them to see whether it works. And they expelled the inhabitants of five villages under the eyes of the British soldiers who were there or still there until May 48. And they found out that it was quite easy, that it, it didn't take much. There wasn't much resistance. Uh, the British did not interfere. تشرد أو تشتت أو ال ال الفلاحين الفلسطينيين الموضوع اللي كان بالحركة الصهيونية إنه بدنا إحنا دولة ما أكل عدد ممكن من من العرب. March the 10th proved to be a fateful day. The final meeting was on the 10th of March 1948 when they when they drafted the plan known as Plan D or Plan Dalit, which finalized the last details about the how to expel the Palestinians and dispossess them. Ben Gurion Ata Talimat Bemostalah Mazifu Yani a bishop take the Rotor do Arab Otor. A diary entry from Ben Gurion exposes the extent of the Zionist agenda. He writes In each attack, a decisive blow should be struck, resulting in the destruction of homes and the expulsion of the population. The Palestinian and Arab fighters were determined to resist. This newspaper from March the 16th, 1948, reports that a Jordanian volunteer, a commander of the Haifa garrison, was trying to obtain weapons. His name was Mohammed Al Hunayti. كان والدي في حيفا، ولما رأى أن المناظرين ينقصوا من التدريب والسلاح حز في نفسه، فاستثار همم. ضباط الصف من الجيش العرب الأردني واستعدوا أنهم يلبسوا ملابس مدنية ويدربوا المناظرين طبعاً كلوب باشا كان قائد الجيش الأردني طلب والدي وقال له أنت يعني ليش تعمل هيك قال له أنا عربي وعلي أني أساعد أهل العرب إحنا بندافع عن أرض العرب وعن الصخرة وأنت ما بتعرف شو معنى الصخرة لا بالنسبة للأمة العربية والإسلامية فلما شعر والدي أنه عليه ضغط استقال من الجيش العربي فتوجه والدي إلى بيروت ودمشق للحصول على الأسلحة حصل على كميات من الأسلحة في أثناء عودته من من في قافلة السلاح من بيروت إلى حيفا كانوا شباب نادي أسامة العكي بانتظارها فعكا بيشوفوهم لليهود قالوا إحنا شايفين اليهود قاعدين بيجمعوا لك وحطوا لك موانع من ثلاث أربعة أيام فالأفضل أنك تعود بالقافلة عن طريق بيروت دمشق عمان قال لهم أنا إذا بغيب عن حيفا يوميا تسقط حيفا ولذلك لازم أخترق الموانع حي Al Hunayti was killed in an ambush on the road to Haifa. He had fought for Palestine 
and had paid the ultimate price. Abdul Qadir al Husseini was the charismatic commander of Palestinian forces in the Jerusalem area. He traveled to Damascus to plead for arms. He returned empty handed. On the 6th of April, he wrote a letter to the Arab League holding it responsible for leaving the Palestinians defenseless and without arms. Eventually, al Husseini had to sell his grandfather's land to buy weapons. On April the 8th, he rushed to the defense of Al Castel, a village overlooking the Tel Aviv Jerusalem Road. Here, Arab fighters faced heavily armed Jewish forces. Al Husseini was an experienced commander, having fought against the British during the 1936 Arab Revolt. he was killed in the Battle of Al Castel. His funeral drew a large crowd of mourners. His death was a severe blow to the Palestinian morale. Jewish forces were gaining the upper hand. They began to seize areas that the UN partition plan had allotted to the Arab state. In this land grab, little discrimination was made between fighters and civilians. At dawn on April the 9th, 1948, a combined force of Ergen and Stern Gang fighters moved into the village of Deir Yassin, near Jerusalem. The result was a massacre. Over a hundred Palestinians were killed, including women, children, and the elderly. <laughs> كانت تبعد 2 أو 3 كيلو متر عن مكتب مدير البوليس البريطاني في القدس وعندما أخبروه بأن هناك مذبحة تدور في دير ياسين لم يتحرك وقال هذا ليس من شأننا The British very sadly let down the Arab population of that there is no doubt because we were there the Palestine police force to police the country ما أظن أنهم كان مبسوطين مع هذه النهاية كانوا يشعروا بشكل of uselessness بعد الشرطة الذي حكيته معهم قالوا لي في هذه الفترة قد نمشي في الشارع نرى الصراع بين يهودي وفلسطيني وإحنا زي ما ما كنش في المكان British troops began their withdrawal a month before the date set for the end of the mandate. As soon as they moved out of an area, Jewish fighters moved in. فهذول أهل القرى اللي قرار راحوا يستلموا المعسكر الكام ففاجأوا في اليهود راحوا لك اليهود مارك زين لما انكربوا اليهود رشوا اللي رايحين إيش مات وإيش انجرح اللي انجرح يزحف يوصل بين الشجر والكمح واللي ما ظل مات ولا حد جابه ولا إيش بريطانيا أعطت سلاحها لليهود كانت اليهود مدرعاتها دباباتها اسلحها كلها سلمت اليهود وطلعت بريطانيا جاء دو طبريا في 16 نيسان وجاء الجيش البريطاني كان في طبريا يحدد السكان العرب بان عليهم ان يغادروا المدينه بعض السكان بداوا بالمغادره بقي منهم عدد كبير للدفاع عن المدينه ووالدي كان من العائلات الفلسطينية بقيت ورفضت أن تخرج من المدينة في 16 الشهر و17 الشهر فجاء ضابط بريطاني إلى والدي والدي باعتباره قسيس أنه يا قسيس عليك أن تغادر المدينة حتى يغادر أبناء الطائفة المدينة فقال والدي لا لن أغادر هذه بلدي وفلسطين بلادي وأريد أن أبقى فيه حيث أنا 
وزع وقال الضابط الحجه الزعم المالوف انه اليهود لهم حق بفلسطين والدي كان عنده الجواب الكافي انه لا حق لليهود بفلسطين ضابط جاء بشاحنه وبقوه وضع والدي وشقيقته والدتي كانت بالمستشفى مريضه بالقلب جيء بها اخرجت من المستشفى وضعت بالشاحنه واخرجوا من الطبلية ولم يبقى في الطبلية الا عدد محدود من المقاتلين واستشهدوا جميعا On April the 18th, the British army withdrew from the city of Tiberias. Before leaving, they forced some 5,000 of the city's Arab inhabitants to evacuate their homes. The following day, Jewish forces seized Tiberias. I saw with my eyes how the British soldiers were able to get the Palestinians from Haifa to Akka. ترحيل عملية ترحيل الفلسطينيين شاركت بها القوات البريطانية. April the 21st. By noon, the last British troops completed their withdrawal from Haifa. That very afternoon, the city was stormed by thousands of Haganah fighters. Some Palestinians and Arab volunteers stayed to defend their homes. After a two-day street battle, 60 of them had been killed. The rest withdrew from the city. From Haifa, heading north to um, Lebanon, came right past the trade school billet entrance gates. And it was a sad sight to see many poor Arabs, some with pickup trucks, cars, beds on the top, some on foot, never ending stream of Arabs coming out of the city. The Jews to drive a lot of the Arabs out of Haifa. Very sad sight. We could have stopped all that. There was no doubt about that we had the armor to do it. Fifty thousand Arabs were forced to flee their homes in Haifa, never to return. Today, a memorial stands in the city. Erected by the Israelis, it commemorates what they call the liberation of Haifa. By late April 1948, the city of Haifa had fallen to Jewish forces. The coastal town of Jaffa was now their next target. قتال في يافا منطقة الجبلية من أشرس المناطق اللي كانت تقاتل هي متاخمة لتل أبيب والجوار هذول تقاتل دفاع عن يافا. تعرف مين كان يقودها امرأة امرأة يعني قيادة القوة اللي كانت المتطوعين اللي كانوا هناك امرأة اسمها مهيبة خرشيد هذا للتاريخ كمان وأنا شايفها بلباسها العسكري ومقاتل Although designated as part of the Arab state in the 1947 UN partition plan Jewish forces set their sights on Jaffa During the last week of April, bombing of the city intensified. The city's inhabitants were forced to flee the shelling, by sea to Lebanon and by road to East Palestine and Jordan. By May the 14th, 1948, the Haganah had taken control of Jaffa. 70,000 of its inhabitants had fled. The remaining males were transferred to central detention camps.
Detainees were forced to bury the corpses of fellow citizens now rotting in the streets. They were also forced to transport the contents of Arab homes ransacked by Jewish fighters. كانوا يأتون بالشاحنات ويفرغوا المنازل العربية من كل محتوياتها الهامة يعني من فرقات القدر أنه كانوا يأخذون المكتبات الهامة زي مكتبات السكاكيني ونقول صغاء زيادة وحتى المكاتب العادية وتؤخذ إلى حيث تودع اليوم في المكتبة الخاصة بالجامعة العبرية في القدس المنهج اللي اعتمدته المنظمات العسكرية الصهيونية في عملية التهجير فالبصة كمثل تم حصارها وقصفها من ثلاث جهات وأبقيت المنطقة الشمالية مفتوحة طبعاً والشاطر يفهم المقصود إنه المنطقة الشمالية مفتوحة شو بنقدر نوقع إحنا ضحايا بيكون منيح نعمل ترويع وتخويف للسكان وهذا اللي صار مع أهل البصة إنه بنتيجة الحصار والقصف بالطائرات والمدفعية وعملية تهجير السكان صارت بالألف اللي ما غدروا يهربوا تخبوا في كنيسة البصة وبعد ما دخلت قوات الهجناء على البصة أخرجوا أربعة وتم قتلهم شباب وصبايا بجيل ال عشر والخمسة 15 والبقية قاموا في ترحيلهم الهجرة تمت إلى لبنان لأنه تم قصف القرى والإغلاق عليها من ثلاث جهات كذلك التهجير كان إلى سوريا من خلال محاصرة من ثلاث جهات والإبقاء على الجهة الشرقية الشمالية فيما يتعلق في القرى الفلسطينية المحاذية لمنطقة الغور نفس الأسلوب ومن هون تم خلق قضية اللاجئين من قبل المؤسسة العسكرية الإسرائيلية It happened many times that the Israeli, very, whole, very holy uh, 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 soldiers, took ten of the youngsters in the middle of the village, shot them just in order to kill them, in order that all the others will see it and run away. And if it's not enough, they took others also. The Palestinians left of their own accord um, and in the expectation of a triumphal return. Another variant of this version is that the Palestinians left on order from their leaders to clear the decks for the invading um, uh, Arab armies. And they'll promise that after the great Arab victory, they'll be able to return to their homes. So that is the traditional uh, Zionist um, version, and it's completely untrue and uh, there is a massive amount of hard evidence to contradict um, this version. Half of the Palestinians became, who became refugees were already expelled from their houses uh, by May 1948. So why I could say that uh, out of the 530 Palestinian villages that were destroyed in the 1948 uh, Nakba, uh, half of these villages were already demolished by the 15th of May. Ethnic cleansing is an ideology that wants to get rid of one ethnic group in its entirety from the place where it lives. The second stage of ethnic cleansing is to erase these people from the place's history. So it's also a cultural act of erasure, of wiping them out of history, of out of memory. Uh, and the third stage is to make sure that they will never come back. Although the British army was still present in Palestine, Jewish paramilitaries seized control of five major cities. Some 200 villages were destroyed. Ahead of the full British withdrawal, more than 350,000 Palestinians were driven from their land. 
May the 15th was the date set for the end of the British mandate. Yet for the Jews, this posed a problem. The 15th fell on a Saturday, the Sabbath. So celebratory announcements of the Jewish state were sent out a day earlier, on Friday, May the 14th. The British army hastened their retreat. The Jews had been gearing up to take over. In fact, they were issuing Jewish stamps before the um, uh, 14th of May. A few days before, I've still got two Frank. They, they issued in their own stamp. They were geared up, mind. They were geared up and ready to go. No doubt about that. On May the 14th, 1948, in this grand Jerusalem home, the last British High Commissioner of Palestine, Alan Cunningham, signed a document terminating the British mandate. Over three decades, the British presence had helped pave the way for the realization of the Zionist's dream. The minutes of Britain's mandate are ticking to an end. In the morning, Cunningham inspected the Guard of Honor in front of his Jerusalem home. He then flew to Haifa. From Haifa, he sailed to Cyprus, and the British flag was lowered. From the time the British occupied Palestine in 1917 to when they left in 1948, the number of Jews is estimated to have multiplied 10 times to half a million. Meanwhile, as the British bid farewell to Palestine, Ben-Gurion arrived in Tel Aviv to ceremoniously declare the independence of the State of Israel. The State of Israel was signed into existence at the stroke of a pen by 25 leading members of the Jewish community. Behind Ben-Gurion hung a portrait of Theodore Herzl, author of the book The Jewish State, published back in 1896. The Star of David was hoisted, the very same flag that had been raised at the settlement of Rishon Letzion in 1885. Since uh, Zionism is a dynamic um, movement, they, there was no, they knew that there was no finality about the borders then. Um, they knew that opportunities would arise in due course to um, take the rest of it. And they did um, in 1967. That was the thinking behind um, the Zionist movement. Gradual, the, the building of a Jewish state and then the gradual expansion of the borders of the Jewish state. Israel, they have named their state, and the new citizens of Israel cheer the men who have signed the Jewish Declaration of Independence. They leave the hall, Ben Gurion first. Then Goldie Meyerson, woman member of the new Council of State, and Foreign Minister Moshe Sheftok. Haim Weizmann becomes Israel's first president. Minutes later. Minutes after the Tel Aviv ceremony, the United States amended a document on what they had previously referred to as a new Jewish state. The new wording now read, the State of Israel. It was signed by President Harry Truman and then announced by the US representative to the United Nations. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the new state of Israel. A new state was born on the foundations of the British Mandate. الذي حصلوا عليه إنهم ورثوا نظام الدولة الإنجليزية. عندما أعلن الاستقلال لم يهدموا البنى القائمة. أخذوها كما هي. يعني في واقعية وبرغماتية رهيبة عند القيادة الصهيونية الأولى بقيادة بن غوريون. يعني البنية الدولة تأخذ من الانتداب 
من الجيش للأمن لا كما هي ثم يبدأون بصهيانتها عندما تم الإعلان عن إقامة الدولة العبرية في تل أبيب مباشرة تم مباشرة كانت المؤسسات تعمل في القدس الغربية سواء كانت عن طريق البنوك أو مؤسسات الطابو أو مؤسسات السياسية أو مؤسسات البلدية لو كان شخص يهودي يعيش في تل أبيب في يوم 15-5 أي ثاني يوم بعد ما أعلن الدولة أذهب إلى مكتبي إذا كنت أشتغل في دائرة الصحة وأجد كل السجلات موجودة وكل الأعمال موجودة ومكتبي كما هو ناقصا شيئا واحدا فقط وهو أن زميلي الفلسطيني قد هجرناه وطردناه من من وطنه ولذلك أن استلموا دولة كاملة ولذلك أنا بقول أنهم استلموا إسرائيل انستنت ستيت دولة جاهزة دولة جاهزة ناقصا أهلها للطبيعيين The British had not allowed forces from neighboring Arab countries to enter Palestine until after their departure. By May the 15th, with the last British troops gone, Arab armies entered the country from the borders of Lebanon, Egypt, and what was then called Transjordan. Their declared objective, to liberate Palestine. That day, the New York Times ran the headline, Jews in grave danger in all Muslim lands. I've come back to the United States to tell Jews in the United States how the state of Israel has been formed. The Jews are holding their ground in the country in spite of the fact that they have been outnumbered by the Arabs and the Arabs have come much better equipped with heavy arms than the Jews have in their possession. The reason is a, simp a simple one. Jews who are fighting in Palestine, the state of Israel, are fighting for the only thing that they have in their possession. It means life or death to them. The Jewish forces in 1947-48, I mean, they were far stronger, even far more numerous, actually, than uh, the combined Arab armies. Uh, they were highly prepared, uh, highly dedicated, well-armed, um, fighting force, which was superior to all the Arab armies combined, except perhaps one army, which the one army which they didn't really take on, and they made a deal with, really, talking about the Jordanian army. In the fact, the Jewish army, the seven that entered Palestine, in the beginning, did not increase the number of their number from 24,000 people. And this is a miracle. أن كل الجيش العربية التي شاركت لم تكن لتصل إلا لثلث أعداد اليهود العسكريين المدربين المستعدين للقتال الجيش العربي لم تكن معدة لم تكن مستعدة لم تكن منظمة لم يكن هنالك القيادة الموحدة بقيادة الملك عبد الله كانت تعمل في جانب والآخرين يعمل بجانب آخر الجيش العراقي تلقى تعليماته من بغداد was in fact one of the most um, bitterly divided disorganized and ramshackle coalitions in the history of modern warfare. كانت بأمريكا تقف إلى جوار كان حتى حسبيات يقف إلى جوارها وما كانت بريطانيا وكل عالم نحن لم يكن يقف إلى جوار الحين يعني بكل المقاييس كانت المعركة تسير في صالح المنظمة الصهيونية. Two days after the Arab armies entered Palestine, the Israeli forces drew their focus on Acre. جاءوا اليهود واحتلوا تل نابليون ومن هذا التل بدأوا يطلقون نيرانهم على البلدة القديمة كنا ننتظر. مجيء النجدة العربية لم يأتي أي أحد. Acre fell, and ten thousand of its inhabitants were expelled. إجا عنا يوم الأيام مجيد بيك أرسلان. قالوا له يا بيك يا باشا صفت صفت وعك صفت وإحنا عدنا بالنص هون وإحنا ما في عنا سلاح ولا شيء. شو بقولنا؟ قال ما كنت متأمل من أهالي ترشيعة أسمع الكلام ماذا 
والله عندما تسقط بيروت تسقط ترشيحة راح ولا هو بعث لنا أنت تانك رايفل هذول اثنين مدفعية من أيام ستة 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 ستة, ستة. مدورين معهم كل واحد رصاصة قال هذا بخصيص من الدولة اللبنانية وهذا بدنا حقه فهم ظلوا على الشارع خذتوا اليهود إيه؟ في بيجوا عراقي لعنا فهم ضابط اسمه جاسم قال له يا ابو سامي بتعرف شو بقولوا بالعراق اليوم؟ قال له شو؟ قال له بي... لما بقولوا دخلنا ترشيحه بيهللوا بكبروا لما دخلنا عكا بيهللوا بكبروا لما بفلان عكانا بكبروا بيعرفوش احنا ما احتلناش ولا ولا مستعمره انا راي على العراق ان كان بدهم يقاتلوا والله جاي اقاتل كان بدهم يقاتلوا في عندنا اكل بناكل هناك احنا قانون الدول العربية عمي ما طلعنا احنا شوي وانا جاي من عبد الاله قالوا لهم حل ما بدكم ترجعوا رجعوا صاروا ما فيش والله يعني كيف من هالتراب ويعفروا على روسهم الجيش العراقي خياني 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 انا مضيت معظم الوقت مع الجبهة الاردنية كنت اطلع على الجبهة العراقية ورحت على الجبهة المصرية ما يقدرش الواحد يقول عنهم شيء وبالعكس ناس حماسهم قوي وعملهم قوي لكن للاسف وعدائهم للعدو الحقيقي وعدائهم لقيادتهم الانجليزيه اللي على مستوى كتيبه وسريه وهذا كمان خصوصا الجيش الاردني كبيره The Jordanian army was commanded by the Englishman Sir John Glubb known as Glubb Pasha Over 40 other British officers also served in the army and held great influence. Under British advice, King Abdullah of Transjordan agreed to a secret deal with the Jewish leaders to avoid clashes between the Jordanian army and the Jewish fighters in return for the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Such token resistance was the reason Glubb later called the 1948 war the phony war. Glubb is a very complex character he was not the simple-minded soldier that he pretended to be, but he was a highly sophisticated politician who imposed on the Arabs Britain's partition plan. The meeting was between Ernest Bevin, the Labour government's foreign secretary, uh, and uh, Tawfiq Abul Hoda, the Jordanian prime minister, who was accompanied by Glab Pasha, who also acted as an interpreter. Bevin asked Abul Hoda, what do you plan to do? And uh, Abul Hoda said, we plan to send the Arab Legion to protect and keep the Arab part of Palestine. And Bevin said, that seems the sensible thing to do, but do not go and invade the Jewish part. 2nd of May, they met for the last time British officers in the Arab Legion to find a solution for Jerusalem, but it didn't work. But what else happened in that meeting is that they brought maps which showed where the Jordanian Legion would stop and would not enter the Jewish state. And where the Jordanian Legion stopped is today the border of the West Bank. That's how the West Bank was actually created. <laughs> On July the 10th, the Jordanian forces pulled out of Lod and Ramla. Clear of Jordanian forces, the two cities were bombed by what was now the Israeli Air Force. The Israeli army then moved in, commanded by Colonel Moshi Dayan. In Lod alone, over 100 Palestinians were massacred inside the Dahmash Mosque. More than 50,000 Palestinians were expelled from the two cities. Walking without provisions in the summer heat, many died of exhaustion in what has since become known as the Lidda Death March. Despite the presence of the Arab forces in Palestine, atrocities were still committed, yet few are well documented. Israeli historian Theodore Katz submitted a thesis claiming the Israelis had committed a massacre in the coastal village of Tantura. They closed all the four sides of Tantura, kind of a boat 
from the Israeli Young Navy that was closing the side of, of, of the seashore in order that they won't be able to run away. What I heard from one of the Jews I uh, interviewed, a soldier in the second company, he was moving with his pistol of nine millimeters on the shore among the men, asking them, where is your rifle? Those who said that my rifle is somewhere next to my house was uh, taken like this with a rope to his house by two or four people. And uh, the text was then, the rifle came out and the one did not. And those who answered there on the, on the beach, I have no rifle, were directly shot in their head. Now, this is not a Palestinian story. This is a Palestinian of a Jew that was a lawyer in the state of Israel many years. The Palestinian men of the Torah were taken to the cemetery. And there, there was, uh, they were uh, told, they were put in lines and they were told to begin digging. And whenever a line finished digging, they were shot and fell down inside. There was no worry on the Zionist leadership side that the soldiers would not understand what is expected of them, because they already de dehumanized the Palestinians in their thinking and perception long before the operations themselves began. The State of Israel was formed through blood and fire, yet this was neither the start nor the end of suffering for the Palestinians.